Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. On the face of it, Israel has achieved a form of stability, led by the same man for eight years, locked in a state of hostile non-communication with the Palestinians, confident of strong support from Washington. But look a little deeper and cracks appear. Prime Minister Netanyahu is under investigation. Israeli society appears ill at ease with itself. My guest is Moshe Yalon, Mr. Netanyahu's former defense minister turned harsh critic. How fragile is Israeli unity? Moshe Yalon, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Israel has just marked and celebrated 50 years since the victory in the Six Day War. But you seem to feel right now there are very serious questions about the direction Israel is going in and about national cohesion. Why are you so worried? From the Security point of view, we enjoy today uh, a relatively calm situation, security-wise. This is a result of the Six-Day War, in which I believe it was the peak of the idea of Arab coalition. Since then, the idea of Arab coalition, trying to eliminate the state of Israel, Nasserism, Baathism, Pan-Arabism, this kind of ideologies have been declined. So it's not an existential security threat that you feel is most concerning to Israel today? Yes, but uh, you know, uh, anyhow, uh, Israel enjoys a vibrant de democracy. In one hand, it is shameful that uh, Netanyahu is a third prime minister to be investigated because of allegations of corruption. One prime minister is in jail. That's the bad news. The good news is that we have a uh, vibrant uh, society. We have uh, law enforcement uh, authorities which are independent, as we can see it. So it is internal struggle about... Uh, but it's not just about Netanyahu, is it? I mean, you said this not long ago. It caused a real stir in Israel. You said, to my great sorrow, extremist and dangerous elements have taken over Israel and in particular the Likud party and are shaking the foundations of the country and threatening to hurt its residents. Those are very powerful words. It is. And I had uh, too many disputes before my decision to resign from the government because of certain trends which I didn't like. Extremism. You see extremism, extremism yes, in your yes. own government that you loyally uh, served yes, for that, seven years. That, that's right. But you know, uh, it is a vibrant society. So I have the uh, uh, capability to deal with it, to criticize the government. There are but many. You, you also have a responsibility powers. to be clear about what you mean. So I want you to tell me exactly what you mean by this extremism you, you know, see from the, inside the Israeli government. From the internal point, point of view, because of political survivability, I found too many politicians generating hatred against someone, against the Arabs, against leftists, against the media against the Supreme Court, which is a threat, it is a challenge, and we have to deal with it, and I believe we are able to deal with it. Isaac Herzog, formerly of Labour Party, now the Zionist Union, he coined this extraordinary word, he called it the fascistization of Israel under Netanyahu. Sounds like you're almost agreeing with him. Uh, certain elements are going this direction, and I worry about it. You would use That's... that phrase, fascistization, would you? In, you know, in, in, in certain parties, yes. And certain politicians are going this way of racism, fascism. This is not the vast majority of politicians, but it is unfortunately is not uh, uh, stopped. Uh, by the Prime Minister, and that's why I had too many disputes with him. I am very, very puzzled as to how you could sit in Cabinet as, I think, Deputy Premier 
for three or four years and then as defense secretary the senior security post in the cabinet for what more than three years serving as a loyal ally of Benjamin Netanyahu and then you fall out with him after seven years of service and come out saying that he's fostering extremism and possibly fascistization of Israel it, it seems extraordinary it wasn't the case until 2015 elections Let's put it this way. Well, he suddenly and changed, did he, all overnight? Uh, the Likud party has been changed. I joined the Likud party in which the rule of law was above all. And this has been changed. Certain figures, politicians well known, like Benny Begin and Dan Meridor and Mikhail Eitan, couldn't win the primaries of the Likud party. So it's, it's a challenge, but I believe the Israel society can, can cope with it. Let, let, we'll get to the bigger strategic picture in a moment, but let's just stick to the internal politics of, of Netanyahu, the Likud party and the right wing in Israel, because you have become a critic now, but you've been intimately involved for an awful long time. How can you say that you have absolutely no doubt that Benjamin Netanyahu is guilty of these allegations, all of which he absolutely adamantly denies, some of which concern his personal behavior, some of which concern the behavior of others to do with a defense contract, particularly involving submarines, which Netanyahu himself isn't involved with, but people close to him are. You say you have no doubt uh, that, that if he is not indicted, you say, I will go on a speaking tour and tell all. Well, what is it you know that the rest of Israel doesn't? No, I'm not going to elaborate about it. It is still under investigation, and I don't want to harm the process. But what I said, that I'm sure that at the end, people should be indicted. If not, then I will go publicly to share all my information, knowledge about this uh, probe with the entire uh, people of Israel as a public issue. People don't change their spots, do they? I mean, you say Netanyahu somehow flipped in 2015, around the time of the election. You'd served him by then for, what, six years. You can't tell me that the man you knew for six years suddenly became somebody completely different after that election. It was a quite surprise for myself. I didn't believe that he will be involved in, in corruption affairs. I didn't believe it. Well, of course, he denies it. And I was surprised. And he It happened uh, just in the beginning of 2016. But it is an internal issue that I believe that the law enforcement authorities will deal with it properly. Uh, Netanyahu dismisses everything you say about him with a smile and says that you are just desperate to try to launch your own political career. Uh, frankly, a political career which right now looks like it's really struggling. So he said it. Let's wait and... Uh, see the consequences of the uh, investigations. Is, um, is this not just about Netanyahu? Do you think this is about something corrosive at the heart of the Israeli state, which says something about Israeli values today? Uh, it is in politics. It's not uh, a part of a huge problem in the Israeli society. But the political system has been corrupted, and politicians affect the uh, many fields by being corrupt. Not all politicians are corrupt. But you know, this is not the whole society. I have the opportunity to meet the young generation in Israel, uh, highly educated, highly motivated, uh, looking for leadership, of course. They are frustrated from the current situation in which they don't trust the leadership. It's not just uh, about money and corruption in politics, though, is it? It's about values connected to the very biggest of pictures. For example, Israel's continued occupation after 50 years of the West Bank and what that does to the Israeli psyche and to young Israelis in particular. Uh, you know, it's a matter of choice. I don't see another choice. I don't see alternative for the fact that we have to find a way to deal with the Palestinian challenge because, in one hand, I don't see any chance for a final settlement with the Palestinians. Because you did. You, you, you're the same, Moshe Yalon, who supported Rabin, supported the two-state process, Absol supported Oslo. Yes, I, uh, that's, you know, uh, at the big, very beginning, I supported Oslo to the point that I 
was exposed to the details when I became the head of the intelligence under late Mr. Rabin. I sanctify human lives more than land. That's why I supported Oslo. And when I was told by our leaders at the time, 93 to 95, mm. that it might bring about peace and tranquility, as one who has experience in wars, too many wars, I supported it. When I was exposed to the details in the time of late Mr. Rabin, being his head of the intelligence, I was shocked. So Rabin, Rabin continued to believe. Rabin, and I lived in Israel at the time, and I remember it very well. Rabin repeatedly said, Israel has no choice. We simply have to make peace with our enemies. There is no alternative. That's why I agreed with him that he tried it, but he failed. And I know Rabin's way very well, and in his last speech, uh, before his unfortunate assassination, he delivered a speech in the Knesset, uh, be, bringing the second half of Oslo to be approved by the Knesset on October 95. He, he said the Palestinian Authority should have been and should be less than a state, actually autonomy. We are not going to withdraw the 67 lines because no defensible borders. He knew, he knew what he was talking about. He was the chief of general staff in the Six-Day six War, and he said that the Israeli sovereignty should be imposed on the blocks, on the clusters. He never gave up on the two-state solution. You have to go and to read his speech. He tried the two-state solution, but, and, you know, I don't want to rule the Palestinians. My point is not, is not just about the two-state solution. It's about the idea of no alternative. Just the other day, Ehud Barak, another chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, another former prime minister, said that this government, he's talking about the Netanyahu government, is putting the country on the path to becoming an apartheid state. And it should be brought down if it fails to change course. So you have to listen to what I think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In one hand, I don't believe that is a chance to reach a final settlement to the horizon, not because of us. We tried it many times to include uh, Ehud Barak as Prime Minister in Camp David, and Arafat rejected his proposal. Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas rejected uh, Olmert's proposal in Annapolis. Actually, Palestinian leaders, Arab leaders rejected any partition plan proposal for any division as a territorial compromise in the land of Israel. Now, talking about the, the Palestinians, Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria and the West Bank, in one hand, I don't believe that there is a chance for a final settlement, not because of us, because of them. But you Abu have, Mazen is not ready you to recognize... To, as Abu, is, as Abu, Israelis, do you uh, not have a duty to keep searching, to keep working for a solution? Because if you I'm, do not, I'm trying your to, own people I, will suffer the consequences. But, you know, let's listen to my proposal. In one hand, I don't see final settlement to the horizon. On the other hand, I don't want to rule them. And they enjoy political independence since Oslo. No, uh, they enjoy, me. they have their own parliament, they have their government, they have their uh, uh, president and so forth. I don't want to rule them. But forgive That's, me, you do uh, rule them. And I just look, because I knew that I was going to talk to you today, I did a little terror. bit of research about your post as defense minister and what happened. But a series of reports crossed your desk from UNICEF in 2013 saying the ill treatment of children who come into contact with the military detention system in the West Bank appears to be widespread, systematic and institutionalized. Human Rights Watch, a very detailed report how Israeli security forces use unnecessary force to arrest and detain Palestinian children as young as 11, choking them, throwing strung grenades at them, beating them in custody. These are reports that crossed your desk as Defence Minister, the work of your IDF. This is what the that's, occupation means. That's what the terror means. Do we have a choice? I prefer not to have any checkpoint in the Gaza Strip. I prefer not to go to search in uh, Palestinian houses for terrorists or for weapons. This is the outcome of terror. Their choice was, instead of land for peace, land for terror, and we your, absorbed more than 1,000 casualties your, or land for rockets in the Gaza Strip. Your government, now, let's leave alone the report of these uh, biased, corrupt uh, organizations. Your government, that is the Netanyahu government, which you loyally served until 2016, decided not to negotiate with the Palestinian no, Authority? No, not at all. We were ready to negotiate. You, re you rewrite the history. In 2014, we were engaged in nine months negotiation process with the Palestinians led by Secretary of State Kerry. At the end of this term of nine months, we were asked by uh, 
Secretary Kerry to continue the negotiations according to a certain American document, terms of reference. We said yes, although we had reservations, concerns, which we said we are going to discuss it around the table. Abu Mahmoud Abbas With said respect. no. Did he pay any price for it? He's not accountable. With respect, Minister, you're playing this tit-for-tat game of who was responsible for the breakdown of talks. I'm trying to dig to something deeper about the morals, the values, the cohesion of an Israeli society that has always prided itself on having the very best of humane values. And I'm putting it to you. If you I, listen to I, Israeli soldiers who have served the occupation, like Yehuda Shaul of Breaking the Silence, a group that is now opposed to the occupation, of former IDF soldiers, he says, this is the moral consequence of prolonged occupation of the Palestinian people. That is the corruption of young Israelis who serve that occupation. What is a choice? to allow the Palestinians to have Hamastan in the West Bank as well, like in the Gaza Strip. You know, we are not deployed anymore in Gaza. Saying, you keep saying, what is yeah. the choice? You have to believe in the values of your particular state. We keep the values. I kept the values. You know what you I did in, in 2002. But you described the Palestinian people as a cancer. I didn't do, do it. Well, you did because the Israeli media reported it. So, I, it does it mean that I said it? I didn't say it. Nevertheless, you pick certain so, quotations so did you sue, which did are you, Did you sue them for I, claiming that you described the Palestinian people as, and I'm quoting directly, like a cancer? I didn't say You it. said invisible, but an existential threat. No. It's something very different, but nevertheless, you know. I prefer, How would you have felt I prefer, if, if a Palestinian prefer, leader had described the Israeli Jewish people as a cancer? How would you whom? have felt then? I didn't do it. Well, why don't you? Uh, I, well, you're just accusing. I deny. You're accusing, I deny it. You're so, accusing the Israeli media of peddling lies. Uh, you know, there are so many false allegations, uh, misquotations, or whatever. I know what I believe in. I wish to have a full separation with the Palestinians. We tried. What did we get after Oslo? Land for peace or land for more than 1,000 casualties as a result of homicide bombing attacks? What did we get after implementing this engagement plan in Gaza, rather than thousands of rockets? This is the reality. So what is the choice? To leave now the West Bank for Hamastan, for Palestinian Islamic Jihad, for Daesh? President Donald Trump has said that he, and I'm quoting him direct, is going to fix the Middle East problem, the Israel-Palestine problem, he said the other day, we will get it done. His son-in-law, Jared Kushner, has been sent to negotiate. He himself, Trump, has seen Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas. He says that he believes Abbas is committed to peace. Are you saying the US president is wrong, misguided? No, no. And now he says different uh, uh, things about the reality on the ground. And I believe that this administration is more realistic regarding the situation on the ground. First of all, they tried to convince uh, Mahmoud Abbas not to promote terror by paying salaries to terrorists or to the families of the jihadists and, and so forth. You know, do, you my, think my... It, do you think it is wise for Trump to put a great deal of political credibility and capital on the idea that he can make peace between Israel let's, and the Palestinians? Let's try. You know, so many presidents and secretary of state or whatever tried, Israeli prime minister tried, to solve it. And they failed. Why? Because the gap is huge. Abu Mazen, he can talk about peace, is reluctant to recognize our right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people in any boundaries. Can you bridge this gap? So we have to manage the conflict from the bottom up, improving the situation for the benefit of the Palestinian people and for us. That's what we are doing if now. I may say and so, there are no shortcuts. Right. If I may say so, you sound just like Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. You spent the first part of this interview saying that he was not lo no longer qualified to be Israel's Prime Minister. You clearly want his I, job. But I, your positions on all of the key elements of this, the, the, the fact you won't talk about a two-state solution, you won't talk about land for peace, you seem to be just like Benjamin Netanyahu. And first of all, it might be that he, like myself, regarding the strategic uh, external uh, issues, we didn't have dispute about it, whether it is about Iran, what should be done in the region, in this chaotic situation in the Middle East, or as regard to the Palestinian uh, challenge. As so well. your strategic vision is just the same as Netanyahu's? Almost the same, yeah.
Well, that's hardly going to inspire the Israeli yeah. public to shift from him to what you. What does it, it mean that if we agree about it, this is a reality. This is the outcome of my experience. And I have 37 years of military experience, seven years in government experience. We don't have a partner for what you call the two-state for two-people solution. Uh, but was it escaped uh, from, uh, from the, uh, President Obama proposal in 2014? He escaped from, uh, uh, he got away from Olmert proposal of 2008 after Annapolis. And Arafat escaped uh, from uh, Camp David and so forth. This is you, a reality. You've just speaking, been speaking at a, at a big conference here in London, uh, the Centre for Policy Studies Security Conference. And it just seems to me, if one looks at this in strategic terms, Israel has an opportunity here. There are deep fractures and divisions in the Arab world. Much of it is too simplistic to put it simply as Sunni Shia, but that's a big element of it. There are pragmatic leaders in the Sunni Arab world, let's say Saudi Arabia, let's say Jordan, Egypt, who may well be interested in a long-term alliance of sorts with Israel against Iran if Israel were prepared to make concessions on the Palestinian issue which would let the Arabs in. But you're not ready to do that, are you? No, this is not the case. And I'll tell you, I was in the government when we tried to bring in regional parties from the Sunni Arab camp to cooperate on any kind of regional settlement in the region. First of all, we are on the same boat today. Those who still use the term the Israel-Arab conflict are irrelevant for meanwhile. Why? Because we share common enemies. Iran, uh, global jihad elements, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Muslim Brotherhood elements as well. But Arabs there are not going to buy that as long as you continue to refuse to contemplate a two-state solution we don't refuse, and give the Palestinians we don't refuse, and their I'll dream you, of statehood. And tell you what, what, what really happened with them. We tried to convince them to come in and to generate this kind of political process. They rejected it. Why? Because the Palestinian issue is not in the first priority. They have their own internal challenges. Iran is the main challenge for them. It is about the Shia-Sunni conflict, uh, global jihad elements, and so forth. And when we tried to convince them to, 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 to come into the process, and I was in Aqaba summit, in which uh, it was exposed about in, 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 in Aqaba, they rejected to come in. Do you know that the only Sunni party today who is ready to spend money on the Palestinian issue is Qatar? The Saudis didn't spend a single dollar. The Egyptians, you okay, can talk well, with President you, Sisi, you don't... they are not ready to be invested on the Palestinian issue. Right, so you see it might no... be that All President right. Trump will be able to convince them. We'll be more than happy that he will convince so them. So you to don't come in. see uh, a watershed moment here of diplomatic sort of opportunity for Israel. What you seem to see is more of the same, more of the status quo. So I just put, ask you this as a final question: What is your vision? of where Israel is a generation from now, 25 years from now? Uh, with a political separation, which is a positive outcome of Oslo, I'm not afraid from demography. The Gazans are not going to vote to our Knesset. And I don't want to have a binational state, so the Palestinians who live in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank, they enjoy their own uh, uh, political independence. They can vote to the parliament. They don't have to vote to the Knesset. No, no. Well, you obviously yeah. not. You're, but denying, this is a you're denying their state. This is a reality on the ground today. We can, should keep it as a modus vivendi, it's not a status quo, improving it from the bottom up. Well, but it's going to fail anyhow if the Palestinians will go on educating the young generation to hate Jews, to hate Zionists, and kids from kindergarten are educated to wear explosive belt to kill us. This we, is the main point. And we have to end there. But Moshe Ya'alon, I thank you for being on Hard Talk. Thank you.